Due to an illness in the family, Murard Gabriel, the previously scheduled speaker on this topic, will not be able to make it today. But lucky for us, his colleague, Craig Thompson, will be stepping in as his replacement. In addition to his work on re reconciling forest carnivore habitat with fire management, Dr. Thompson also has the dubious honor of being a forest service expert, expert on the ecological impacts of illegal marijuana cultivation on public lands in the western U.S. Despite recently relocating to Montana, he is still involved in publicizing the risk posed by trespass grows and funding restoration efforts. Welcome, Dr. Thompson. <coughs> Thank you. <coughs> All right. Um, <clears throat> yeah, as, uh, as Shannon mentioned, I've had the opportunity to work with Dr. Gabriel for several years on this topic. Um, graduating from here back in 2006, this is definitely not what you would expect to become an expert on um, going out into the field, but it is what it is. Um, I will apologize right now. Well, I should say, you know, there's always that, that statement about the last talk of the day, um, you know, thanks for making it through and I'll try to keep you awake and all that. I can pretty much guarantee no one's going to fall asleep in this talk. Um, and I will apologize now because it's going to be the most depressing talk that you hear all day. But I will tell you that, that we'll kind of hit bottom and then start to come up a bit at the end. So there is hope. Don't get too depressed. Um, a little bit of background information. As you heard in my earlier talk, starting in about 2006, we started working with Pacific Fishers um, in the Seven Sierras, and we were just studying every aspect of their ecology we could, um, things like density, survival, reproduction, habitat use, etc. Uh, but something happened in April of 2009. Um, this animal, a young male, M09 to be specific, um, our callers had mortality signals, so when the animal died, we would go and we would recover the carcass, and it was our job to get there quickly and determine what happened all that kind of stuff. And so we got to him pretty fast, um, but it was a little weird because he appeared perfectly healthy. You know, there was no predation. There was no, he very fat, strong looking young guy other than he was dead. Um, and so we didn't really know what, what was going on. And so we sent him to the UC Davis uh, veterinary pathology lab for a necropsy as we did it with all the ones that we weren't too sure about. Um, and it came back that he had died of anticoagulant rodenticide poisoning. Um, I didn't put those pictures up that the lab gave us, but it's apparently pretty obvious when they do a necropsy on an animal that dies of this kind of thing. Um, and so, okay, this is not uncommon in the world of wildlife. You know, animals get into this type of stuff. But this was a little weird because this guy, we had had him collared for pretty much his entire life from a juvenile on, and he died about two and a half years old, something like that. And he was living in the southern end of Yosemite National Park. And he was going over into um, Sierra National Forest, almost into wilderness areas. And, and we knew he was not going near cabins. He was not going near agricultural areas or anything like that. So we were kind of puzzled as to where in the world he got into this stuff. Um, and so we had two questions. First, was this an isolated incident? And my co-author here, Dr. Um, Gabriel, he was a PhD student at UC Davis at the time. And he was actually the one who facilitated our necropsies in the veterinary pathology lab. And he decided on a whim to go back and test all of the animals that we had sent the previous three years, just out of curiosity, because this was not something that we had tested for. And what he found, he tested 58 dead fishers, and he found that 49 of them, 79%, showed that they had been exposed to rodenticide. Um, not that they had died of that necessarily, but when you sample the liver, you can quantify how much they had been exposed to. And 79, almost 80% of our animals had been exposed to rodenticides. And um, again, these are wildland animals. And so this was kind of the sky is falling moment for us. This was a what the heck is going on? You know, where, where are these animals getting it? So that was our next question. Where in the world did he get this, this where did he come into contact with this? Where are all these animals getting this stuff? And um, it wasn't until a meeting, and I can remember the room, I think it was a county supervisor's office. And some of us were giving a presentation on carnivores and, and fisher management. And we had all decided, we, we all kind of mentioned this rodenticide in every meeting just because, you know, asking questions. We didn't know where this was going. And this law enforcement agent, a uh, uh, U.S. Forest Service law enforcement agent, came up to us after the talk. And he said, oh, that list of poisons you put up, that kind of looks like what we see at the pot gardens. 
And we all kind of looked at each other and said, what pot gardens? We had no idea what this guy was talking about. Um, <clears throat> it's been downhill since then. Um, <clears throat> and so, yeah, since that was to the, April 2009, that would have been somewhere late in 2009 that we finally started to understand we got a peek behind this kind of law enforcement curtain about what was actually going on in public lands um, in California, and as I'll show later, far beyond California too. Um, these are a couple images of the gardens. You can see they're, they're just a nightmare. Um, this is Mark Higley of the Hoopa Tribe in Northern California. He was helping to clean up some sites. These are all over-the-counter decon packages. He's taking a picture there of a carbofuran. If anybody's familiar with carbofuran, it's a concentrated pesticide that's banned in the United States. Um, it was banned. It was, they used to use it for in the vineyards, and they would spray grapes with it. But they banned it in the early 1990s because it doesn't wash off. It gets absorbed into the plant. Um, so you can think more about that. Um, <clears throat> so, yeah, late 2009, we've, we've kind of found out, okay, this is where this stuff is coming from. Why had we never heard of this before? You know, I'm a, I was a Forest Service biologist, and this was Forest Service law enforcement. So why not? Um, and, and part of it is just that there's this massive social argument about pot and what you want to do with it. Um, and we have, as scientists, very intentionally stayed out of this debate. We don't want anything to do with passing judgment on what people say. Not because we don't have opinions, but because we don't want the science to be judged by people thinking we have an agenda in this. So we just want the science to be judged on its, on its face value. The other thing is that um, people have this idea of outdoor marijuana grows. They think that it's organic, it's mom and pop, it's little things in their backyard, it's, it's just a plant, all that kind of stuff. I can promise you it is not. Um, the vast majority of people are not aware of the industrial scale of what is going on out there. Um, I mean, it, the, these places would qualify, as far as I'm concerned, as super fun sites. They're just horrendous. Um, that's Dr. Gabriel up there. He's wearing a uh, gas mask, actually, because one of the things we discovered early on is that these growers will bring concentrated pesticides of, of all kinds of types, and they will mix them in um, everyday containers. They'll use soda, can, they'll, like, soda bottles. They'll use bleach bottles. They'll use any kind of plastic container they can to mix this stuff up. And if those things get left in the sun for a long time and you touch them, they tend to explode which is um, a very unpleasant thing. And so we learned early on that you, you kind of got to take it seriously when you're out at these sites. These places can be extremely hazardous. Um, this is just pretty common for the type of mess that we find out there. Uh, these are five-gallon buckets of rodenticide dumped in a stream, um, just left to, um, well, just waiting for the next rainfall. Uh, I don't even know what these things are, but parts of, of something that they were drying for jerky, I guess. Um, down here, one very common thing at these sites, a lot of these sites, at least in the southern Sierras, are very dry. And so the growers irrigate by piping water from creeks, from seeps, from um, streams, whatever water source they can find, and they will use a gravity feed with irrigation piping, and they'll run these things for up to half a mile. Um, and they will have packed all this gear into, it, it can be in a wilderness area, it can be a quarter mile from a trailhead. It can be absolutely anywhere. Um, and they will drain these seeps and creeks dry. And so they'll divert all that water into a holding tank of some kind. At these holding tanks, they mix in a bunch of fertilizer um, and oftentimes pesticides as well, just directly into the water. And then they, I, I mean, there's been some really complicated irrigation systems that we've come across, but they will then pipe that water back out to the plant. Um, I can tell you I know of one law enforcement officer that was hospitalized because he fell in, and there was so much toxic whatever in that water that he had to be medevaced out. Um, yeah, you gotta love the pictures. Um, so that up there is carbofuran. That's the banned one that's becoming more and more popular at these sites. We find DDT at these sites. Um, 
volumes of rodenticide like that are, are not uncommon to find. More often, though, it's just dozens and dozens of the little over-the-counter versions that you would buy at Home Depot or, or somewhere. Um, and actually, recently, California enacted a ban on the sale of these second-generation rodenticides, uh, these things, in terms of the volume that your average person can uh, buy. That ban was specifically in response to this issue, but what we've seen at the sites is instead we're seeing more and more of this, which is the first generation stuff, which the ban does not cover. Um, first and second generation rodenticide, that basically just has to do with how quickly the animal will die. Uh, first generation, it takes two or three feedings and maybe three or four days for the animal to die. Second generation, they'll usually die in one feeding. So what that means from a wildlife perspective is the ban, although it was very well intentioned, has actually reinitiated the use of chemicals that are far more likely to give secondary poisoning to the carnivores. Again, I'm a carnivore biologist. I kind of view everything from the lens of the, um, in this case, the fisher that are feeding on the squirrels and the mice. Um, fishers can be very generalist, though, and a lot of times this stuff is flavored with peanut butter, um, cheese, whatever, uh, all of this, these rodenticides are flavored. And so a lot of these carnivore and omnivores will get directly into the bait as well. Um, this one in the middle, it's not just the rodents that they're getting. I mean, they, they spread this stuff extremely liberally around these sites to keep the rodents from eating the plants. Um, but they also, these guys live there year round and they don't like it when the bears and the foxes get into their camp and into their food stash. And so they will actually circle their camp with things like that. And that hot dog has been dipped in concentrated, uh, it's a, a compound called methamyl in this case, very similar to carbofuran. That stuff is so toxic that we found a dead fisher that had a piece of hot dog still in its throat. It hadn't even finished swallowing by the time it died. So these are, these are nasty places. Um, this one up here, again, that's Dr. Gabriel. In this case, he is taking a sample from a fox that was found dead at the site. Um, the fox died of some sort of insecticide poisoning. That right there is the turkey vulture that had been feeding on the fox and was potent enough to kill it. And then the really creepy part, I don't know if you can see all those little black dots in there. Those are flies, and they're dead. They died just from landing on the fox. <clears throat> so, again, kind of... Try to wrap your mind around how toxic some of these sites can be. So we first published a paper on this in 2012. Um, we didn't have a lot of data, but we wanted to get the information out there. We had um, four fishers. When we went back and we reviewed the data, we actually found four that we think died of the rodenticide poisoning. Um, and again, this was out of 50-some animals that were sampled. And again, there's that 79% exposure rate. The animals average 1.6 rodenticides per individual, so they're getting into more than one. Um, and I won't really go into it, but there's synergistic effects when you start getting multiple chemicals in your system. It's not just an additive effect. These things can interact in your system. We also found a kit dead in one of the dens. I mentioned earlier that one of the things we were doing was climbing dens. Um, we found a kit, a nursing kit, that had died of rodenticide. Um, and so the toxin could be passed from mother to kit through nursing. That was not something we knew before this. Um, so the reproductive level implications of this got a lot bigger at that point. Sorry, I told you it would be a depressing talk. We published another paper in 2013, and in this case we tried to extrapolate what we knew about these sites to survival rates, particularly of female fishers in the area. Um, from a scientific perspective, this is kind of a royal pain to deal with. I mean, we're dealing with an activity that is, is covert. We're, we're kind of guessing at how much is out there. Um, we have animals that are dying. We're not really sure if they're... And we know some of them are dying of the, of the toxins that they're getting into. We're not really sure how many of our live animals have been exposed. So, um, you know, a statistician hates this kind of scenario. So everything we're looking at is, is correlative in this case. Now, we can't really do a cause and effect study of any kind. Um, but we can say, you know, that there's an average of 5.3 grow sites per home range for these female fishers. And there is a statistically different, statistically significant difference between the ones that were exposed and the ones that were not exposed. Okay? It's kind of a reach. Um, 
Uh, we know, that, for example, one female fisher had 16 different grow sites within her home range. Um, <clears throat> and we know that there did appear to be a link between the survival of an individual female fisher and the number of grow sites in her home range. So, again, I can't prove that that was a cause of death necessarily in all the cases, but I can say that there's a strong correlative link between these things. In 2015, we revisited the issue. We had a lot more data at this point. We're paying attention. Um, I think we had, a, we had upped the sample to 121 at, at this point. And this was animals that were coming off of our Fisher study, another two other Fisher studies in Northern California. We were basically, you have to have a carcass to test for these things. And so we were collecting Fisher carcasses everywhere we could to try to um, sample them. We had nine additional Expo or nine additional poisonings, meaning direct cause of death. The animal died of anticoagulant poisoning. And our exposure rate is up to 85% now. So we had even more of these animals were getting exposed. Average went up to 1.73 per fissure. Um, and our exposure rate, when you break down the sample size, had gone up from that initial, um, the poisoning per year. So the, the four animals that died per year was 5.6% was of the number that we had. Now this nine additional makes it 18.7%. So now we're, we're, we're reaching the level at almost 20% of our mortality is this human-caused effect. Um, this is the point at which, with particularly a rare carnivore, we're, we're definitely in the realm of having population-level impacts. <clears throat> so just a quick summary of this. Um, same things, we had 79% we had and four deaths throughout California, then 85% and nine deaths. Uh, we have sampled again now with another 14 months of data, another 26 animals, and we're up to 100% now. It is really hard to find a fisher in California that is not exposed to these things. Um, in fact, I have not personally seen one since about 2010. Um, <clears throat> yeah. So the scope of this problem. Um, this map here is, that's a map of over four years of all the grow sites known in California. Um, but these are the known ones. These are the ones that law enforcement found. And depending on who you talk to with law enforcement, they say, oh, we find anywhere between 15 to 60%. I mean, it's probably somewhere in the middle. Who really knows? Um, so you can probably safely double these numbers. Um, 250 to 350 is their estimate of active sites in the state each year. Um, between 2005 and 2012, volunteers on the Sierra and Sequoia National Forest alone cleaned up over 1,100 of these sites. Um, in the fall of 2017, law enforcement knew of 639 that they had busted, but were just still out there. Hadn't, nobody had the manpower or the time or the money to clean it up. Um, and then those are some of the numbers for the amount, for the reclamation that does happen, um, 116 tons, of, that's just trash, camp stuff, propane tanks, all of that. Um, 15 tons of fertilizer, almost 2,500 pounds of rodenticide were removed. And, and that, that's the full bags. That's not the stuff that was already put on the landscape. Um, same with the 16.8 the gallons of restricted pesticides. And this is highly concentrated stuff. And again, this is what was left over, you know, after it got raided. This does not count the stuff that was put on the ground prior to this. Um, the ir irrigation pipe alone is just a stunning thing to see um, in 204 of those man-made dams and reservoirs. And all that was in one year alone. Um, this is a picture. I love this picture. I think it's beautiful. It was taken by a, a friend of mine trying to document this process. But imagine every one of those lights is a little divot where a pot garden was placed. And so when this place was originally found, every one of those lights had two to three handfuls of rodenticide pellets scattered in it. So again, think back, back to that map of California and put this kind of, you know, that level of poisoning going on in the landscape. And then this is a 2017 map uh, nationwide of Forest Service estimates of grow sites on public land. So you can see, obviously, California's a mess with this stuff. But there are some other very serious spots as well. Um, <clears throat> the one thing I, I have to say about this is I don't know if any of these other sites, I know California, Oregon, and up into Washington have, have very serious toxicant and poison exposure. Um, I have no idea 
if the rest of the country is suffering that same level of toxicity um, because nobody's looking. Um, we, we broke into this problem because we were looking at fishers for other reasons and law enforcement kind of opened the curtain for us to see what was going on. Nobody's looking in these other areas, so we don't know what's going on. This is actually pretty relevant. As of last month, fishers were put back on the, as a candidate for endangered species listing, um, the West Coast segment. And one of the two primary reasons, reasons that the judge cited was this, the service had not dealt with this toxicant issue. Um, the judge decided that they had acted in, in his words, arbitrary and capricious manner. Um, primarily because the service had decided that there was too much uncertainty about this issue. We don't know what the real level of poisoning is on these animals. We don't know kind of how it interacts. And what the judge said was that wasn't good enough. Uncertainty was not good enough. We have a documented problem and it needs to be addressed. Um, so two things that I'm just going to touch on here real quick, because I don't have time to get into the real details, but every, all those numbers I've thrown up so far <clears throat> are direct cause of mortality. But if you go back into the research on these compounds, there is all kinds of secondary symptoms and sublethal effects. Um, I have no idea if the predation rate that we see on fishers is actually a natural predation rate or if those animals are getting predisposed because they are carrying around a heavy load of carbofuran in their system, um, which has all kinds of partial paralysis and reduced reflexes and all that kind of stuff. Um, the decreased reproduction, a lot of these things have heavy influences on immune function, so disease and healing capacity. Um, we have absolutely no quantification of what these sublethal effects are. The other thing about these uh, growth sites is water usage. And I'm not really going to go into that today because it's not my area, but there is some work. Marijuana is a very water-intensive plant. And throughout a growing season, it takes about 900 gallons to grow one plant. And if you do the math of the number of plants that were eradicated in the state of California in 2017, it's 1.25 million. You do the math, that adds up to 1.1 billion gallons of water that was diverted from the natural flow systems. Now, some of it finds its way back into the creeks, but only after it's been through those cisterns with the fertilizer and the toxicants being mixed in. Um, so with respect to California and the drought and everything else going on, this is a, a topic that kind of we expect to see, well, to see people talk more of. This is a, a, um, a technician of a nonprofit, for example. These are some of the water lines, and that, all of those were feeding into one cistern. And it's not like they shut the tap off, too, when the growing season is over. These things are just left to run. And so wherever this pipe leads could be up to a half a mile uphill. That water is still getting sucked out of that system. Um, and additional species. We kind of view Fisher as the canary in the coal mine. We were looking at Fisher very carefully for all of these other reasons, and this fell in our lap. And only because we had the number of telemetry collared animals out there that we were doing, and only because we were collecting the number of carcasses that we were already doing, could we start to tease this apart. Um, I don't have a picture of uh, a dead spotted owl. But I do know that they've been found poisoned at these sites as well. Every one of these other sites, our photos was taken at a grow site. Um, <clears throat> I can't think of a reason in the world to think that there aren't equal level impacts going on to other wildlife species. Uh, water and soil in these sites. These are some of the work that Dr. Gabriel has been doing. Yes, they've found that the contamination from these sites is getting into the water system. They've been sampling below. Um, and they've also been doing soy, soil samples. And these, um, I don't know exactly what the half-life a lot of these chemicals are, but they're in the soil for a long time. Um, this is where we'll, we'll kind of start going up now. So it'll get a little bit better. Um, one of the things that has been really fascinating about this is this is a, a no-lose situation for any group. Um, you, you take it, in this case, Mule Deer Foundation funded some science for Dr. Gabriel to look at other prey species. They were worried. Uh, they tested 22 deer in Northern California, and they did find one where the meat tested positive for rodenticide. Um, they've also done some other testing, and they found positive samples in quail and black bear. Um, so these contaminated sites, it's more than just the carnivores getting into it. It is potentially a human health hazard, too, um, through these hunter-harvested animals. 
But a lot of these nonprofit organizations or advocacy uh, groups have been really, they've been great in terms of trying to pick this up, spread the news to their, um, their constituents, things like that. This is the Nature Conservancy, Rocky Mountain Elk Foundation, the Sierra Club, California Trout. All of these have run multiple articles in their newsletters. They've funded small projects, things like that. Um, and so the... Um, the feedback and the response of a lot of these groups as we've, as we've talked to them have been wonderful. Um, this is just a quick snapshot of some of the public media articles that have come out. We've got, uh, we've got Poland. Wait, no, I think this one's Poland. I think this one was um, Israel. I can't really remember. Um, I know British Columbia. Uh, we, I, I've given so many interviews on this thing, it's kind of ridiculous. Um, and also in terms of um, legislation, there have been several folks that have, have tried assemblymen and congressmen who have pushed legislation. Like I said, the, um, the ban on um, second generation rodenticides, selling them in bulk quantity in California came as a result of some of this. Um, increased penalties for the use of toxicants on public land as a, a bill that was recently passed in the Congress, and that was a result of this. Um, it also made the 2013 National Drug Control Strategy as a primary concern for the White House. So it's been an interesting thing to be involved in. But I think the most um, gratifying part of it all has been just the different agencies' response, individual response, all those things. These are just some examples of the federal agencies that have got involved in this, um, state and county level agencies, and then just a whole host of nonprofits have gotten involved too. Some of these, like the North Coast Environmental Center, I, I think they were created specifically to help recruit volunteers to help clean up these sites. I'm not 100% sure of that, but it's one of the primary things they do right now, as is the High Sierra Trail crew from uh, the Southern Sierras. They, for years, have been a trail restoration group, and now they've kind of morphed into this ecological reclamation effort. Here are a few photos of these reclamation efforts. And these are one of the more gratifying activities I've ever been involved in, I have to say, um, because it's, it's dirty. I mean, you're literally pulling miles and miles of this pipe out. But, I mean, on one hand, you've got a, a hippie from Humboldt working with you. And on the other hand, as a retired rancher from somewhere on the Eastern Sierras, you got a couple of high school students and a, um, you know, a National Guard sergeant, and that's your team pulling pipe. So the, the, the broad spectrum appeal of this effort, and everybody can get behind it. So that has been an absolutely wonderful response to see. And I think the next slide is a little video that Dr. Gabriel put together. This is a site pre-cleanup. You can see the mess. And then he's got, they put a camera up between the time when this was identified and when it was cleaned up. And you can see the activity that goes on in these sites. They're just digging right in the midst of all that. And then there's the cleanup effort. And that is all the irrigation pipe that was pulled out of that one site. And that's it. So. Thank you, Dr. Thompson. Does anyone have any questions? In front. I noticed some of those cleanup people were like in short sleeves and so on. Do we have to do any kind of um, protection against cleanup people? There has been an evolution of that um, as our understanding of the toxicity of the sites. It has increased. Um, a lot of times there will be a team. Now there's a team that goes in first to deal with the really toxic stuff. And then they'll send in the, the Forest Service is no longer willing to send volunteers into some of these sites. And so um, we kind of got a two tier system where a, um, a hazmat crew, literally of some kind, will go in first, deal with the real toxic stuff. And then you'll send people in to, because paying a hazmat team to pull. 20 miles of irrigation would be just outrageously expensive. And so trying to get the cost down somehow. Um, 
Yes, and even on those sites, we usually have very intensive training ahead of time. If you see X or Y, don't touch it. There'll be two or three people with each group that are trained to handle those things. Because, I mean, carb they love to mix carbofuran and Gatorade bottles. I don't know why, but you'll, you'll find that stuff just scattered around under the bush. So, yeah. <laughs> in California and Oregon, all of that impacted these illegal pot gardens and the occurrence of them? Um, it hasn't yet, as far as I know. Um, that is a far more complex question, I think, than people typically realize. I've talked to a lot of law enforcement agents about it. The, the, the market forces behind Pot Garden, once it's legalized, people's willingness to buy, the, the transport out of state. I mean, they sell from these California grows all over the country, um, and they grow in those land in a lot of ways because it's proximity to Mexico. Um, this is a lot of cartel efforts that are doing this. And so their market is bigger than California. How it will play out over time, I don't really know. But um, they tell me that in, Cal in Colorado and Oregon, which are a little ways ahead, it's actually increased. And it's increased because the market has increased. Um, and there's this gray period while they have to work out regulations and all of that kind of stuff. So right now, it's just kind of in this muddy place where we don't really know. Um, I don't know that off the top of my head. Dr. Gabriel probably would. Um, probably, what was that one number, 1,100 on two national forests. I mean, you're probably talking in the four to 5,000 range, but that's kind of a guess on my part. I don't know. There are these nonprofits in most areas that advertise for volunteers. It's become pretty, pretty popular. Not, not popular, but people really care about this, and, and they get very, um, they really get behind these cleanup efforts. And so, I know at least half a dozen of these volunteer organizations in in Mendocino and Lassen County, you know, spread up and down the state. Um, finding one of those would probably be the best bet. Honestly, Dr. Gabriel and the Integral Ecology Research Center there in Northern California, they, they are kind of the center for a lot of this stuff. Um, they work with most of those organizations. Um, I'm curious if there's ever any security concern in your active grow site or whether there's any avoided until it shows up or how or that? So I ran a, a field crew, forest carnivore field crew in this area for a number of years. Um, my technicians are probably among the best in the Forest Service at differentiating between whether it's this year's trash versus last year's trash, and whether the footprints that they just found in the snow belong there or not, those types of things. Yeah, there's, there's huge security concerns. It has, um, we no longer send technicians out alone into various places until well into the season, and we're confident there's nothing there. Um, there have been parts of our study area. We have stumbled into these grow sites um, more than uh, probably half a dozen times. Um, for the most part, there hasn't been any violence, at least uh, definitely not, not with me, and I've heard a few other reports, um, but it has completely changed the game in terms of doing outdoor work in this, and especially the California environment, but it, I mean, it's nationwide. I think people need to be aware of this all over the place. So we have, I have sent technicians in to collect a fisher carcass that gives off a mortality signal but is, is in a banned area for us. My technicians have walked in with guys with M16s as their guards, which is just ludicrous if you think you're doing wildlife work, but they'll do it. So. Are sites detectable with um, drones? <laughs> um, they used to be. Then the growers got very good at it. Um, they actually have, from what I've heard, they have genetics lab and they've altered the color because marijuana is a bright green plant and it's very visible from um, overhead, but they've actually changed the color of it somewhat so it's, it's harder to see. They'll plant it underneath the canopy, like especially these manzanita areas. They'll thin out underneath, but they'll leave enough cover up high. Um, to block an aerial view. There is a guy at the research station out there who's doing some really interesting work. Um, 
these areas are being flooded with fertilizer as well in a fairly dry environment. And so he's actually looking at biomass production. And he's had some luck in being able to pick these things out simply on the biomass of the surrounding plants because the fertilizer is kind of leaching out from there. So there are ways to do it. It's kind of a, a cat and mouse arms race going on. But uh, the law enforcement is trying, and they're putting a lot of effort into it. Um, that actually, with Fisher, that gets extremely difficult. I mean, we can't test live animals. It's only the carcasses that we can get. And the collars that we put on them are generally either a, a ground telemetry triangulation or an aerial location. We actually have a mountain lion project going as well that have the GPS collars that are much better. Um, and so we are looking at that, but actually with mountain lions and not Fisher. And it, it simply comes down to the battery power of the collar that they can carry. Time for one more question. Sure. <laughs> well, I guess this is more of a comment than a question, but I can see, I mean, this is just one site. I'm overwhelmed. Um, it, it seems like it would be hard to get ahead on any other kind of management issues like adaptive climate change and timber and other species management and invasive weeds and et cetera, et cetera, if natural forests are just trying to deal with this all the time. This seems like this would like usurp most of the money and funds and people. For the most part, at least the Forest Service says that this is a law enforcement issue. And so, so they, they relegate it to the law enforcement. And the law enforcement guys, bless their soul, are totally overwhelmed by this. Um, they are asking for more money and more help. They've got the National Guard often helping them. Um, the management side of the Forest Service, um, I, I personally don't think is taking this as, as aggressively as they should. Um, I, I, having walked a lot of these sites myself, I mean, this is, these things are horrendous. Um, and I also think they're a huge safety hazard for recreationists out on the woods. Um, and so, yeah, I agree with you. <laughs> okay. Thank you, Dr. Right. Thompson. Thank you for all of our speakers today. Thank you all for coming.